Welcome to the lecture on Chapter 32 in your text, Pediatric Emergencies. At the completion of this unit, the EMT will understand the anatomy and physiology of the child as compared to the adult. You will learn the appropriate assessment and care for the types of illness and injury affecting children of all ages, injury patterns based on size, and special body system injuries. You will also learn the indicators of abuse and neglect and the medical and legal responsibilities of an EMT. According to the National EMS Education Standard Competencies for Special Patient Populations, the EMT will apply a fundamental knowledge of the growth, development, and aging, as well as assessment findings, to provide basic emergency care and transportation for a patient with special needs. Specific to the pediatrics age group, age-related assessment findings and age-related assessment and treatment modifications for pediatric specific major diseases and or emergencies, including upper airway obstruction, lower airway reactive disease, respiratory distress, failure and arrest, shock, seizures, and sudden infant death syndrome. The EMT will also be able to identify and assess age-related assessments, developmental stage-related assessments, and treatment modifications for pediatric specific major diseases and or emergencies, including upper airway obstruction, lower airway reactive disease, respiratory distress, failure and arrest, shock, seizures, sudden infant death syndrome, and gastrointestinal diseases. Specific to patients with special challenges, the EMT will recognize and report abuse and neglect and will understand the health care implications of abuse and neglect in the pediatric population. Specific to trauma, you will apply the fundamental knowledge to provide basic emergency care and transportation based on your assessment findings for an acutely injured patient. Special considerations in trauma, you will recognize and manage trauma in the pediatric patient population, as well as understand the pathophysiology and be able to assess and manage trauma patients in the pediatric population. Pediatric patients have their own set of health-related problems that are unique to the population. Many problems that are common in adults do not occur in children, and it is important to remember that children are not small adults. Management can be difficult for health care providers, and remember that pediatrics is a specialized medical practice devoted to the care of the young. Many EMTs experience a level of discomfort in responding to and caring for pediatric patients in distress. These patients differ in how they respond physiologically and emotionally to stressful events, and an EMT with proper training and an understanding of this patient population is able to learn the tools necessary to form a baseline assessment and plan of care. In most situations, caring for an infant child also requires caring for the parents or caregivers. Once you learn how to manage emergency treatment with children, you will learn that it is actually very rewarding. Communications with families and the patient. You may interact with more than one patient. Remember, family members or caregivers often need help and support. A calm parent contributes to a calm child. An agitated parent means the child will also be agitated. You should remain calm, efficient, professional, and sensitive. There is no specific age at which childhood ends. Between birth and adulthood, many physical and emotional changes occur. The thoughts and behaviors of children as a whole are often grouped into stages. Infancy is the first year of life. The toddler age is from one to three years. The preschool age child is from three to six years. The school aged child is six to 12 years. And adolescents generally range from 12 to 18 years. Infancy is usually defined as the first year of life. The first month after birth is called the neonatal or newborn period. From zero to two months, here are some things to be aware of. Infants less than two months spend most of their time sleeping or eating. They respond mainly to physical stimuli such as light, warmth, hunger, or sound. Infants may sleep for up to 16 hours a day between feeding times and caregiver interactions, and they should be aroused easily from a sleeping state. They have a sucking reflex for feeding, and they are also predisposed to hypothermia. Crying is one of the main modes that they express themselves. Infants cannot tell the difference between parents and strangers at this age. Their basic needs consist of being warm, dry, and fed. Their hearing is well developed at birth, and a calm, reassuring talk is helpful in soothing them. 
From two to six months, they're more active at this stage. It makes them easier to evaluate. They spend more time awake and they do recognize their caregivers. They will often have a strong sucking reflex, active extremity movement, and a vigorous cry. They may be able to follow objects with their eyes. They also have an increased awareness of their surroundings and will use both hands to examine their, any objects. They will begin to roll over at this stage and remember, persistent crying, irritability, or lack of eye contact may be an indicator of serious illness, a depressed mental state, or a delay in development. Six to twelve months of age, infants begin to babble. By their first year, they say their first word. They have learned to sit without support, and they begin to crawl and finally begin to walk. This does predispose this age group to increased danger physically. Infants in this group also begin teething and are prone to putting objects in their mouths. They are at a higher risk of foreign body aspirations and poisonings because of this. Persistent crying or irritability can be a symptom of serious illness and they may show signs of preferring to be with their parents or caregivers and they may cry if separated. And this is called separation anxiety. To assess an infant, you should begin by observing them from a distance. Let the caregiver continue to hold the infant during the assessment and provide as much sensory comfort as possible. Be sure to warm your hands as well as the end of your stethoscope and do any painful procedures at the end of the assessment process. The next age or stage we're going to talk about is the toddler stage. After the infancy stage at one year until three years of age, a child is called a toddler. Toddlers experience rapid changes in growth and development. From 12 to 18 months, they begin to walk and explore. They are able to open doors, drawers, boxes, and bottles, putting them at higher risk. Injuries in this age group increase because, the toddler, because of the toddler's exploratory nature and fearlessness. They begin to imitate behaviors of older children and parents, and they know their major body parts when you point to them. They may be able to speak from four to six words. Because of a lack of molars, they may not be able to fully chew their food, and that does lead to an increased risk of aspiration. From 18 to 24 mo months, the toddler's mind is developing rapidly. Vocabulary will increase from 10 to 15 words to about 100 words. They will be able to name a common object that you point to. Toddlers begin to understand cause and effect. Balance and gait improves rapidly, and running and climbing also improve. Toddlers tend to cling to their parents at this stage or their caregivers and often have objects that comfort them. Toddler assessment. Remember, at this stage, toddlers are very comfortable with their parents and caregivers and may have stranger anxiety. They may resist separation from their caregiver, so you should allow them to hold special objects for comfort. They may be hard to restrain, and remember, they can have a hard time describing pain. You can distract them with toys, and that may be helpful. Persistent crying or irritability can be a symptom of serious illness or injury. Previous medical experiences may lead to hesitation toward you. Preschool age children from three to six years. This is an age group where the most rapid increase in language occurs. Children begin to run. They can start throwing, catching, and kicking during play. At this point in time, toilet training is usually mastered. They also learn which behaviors are appropriate and inappropriate, and tantrums may occur. Foreign body aspiration continues to be at a high risk. For preschool age assessment, children can understand directions and be specific in describing painful areas. Much of the history must still be obtained from the caregivers. You should appeal to the child's imagination to help facilitate the exam process. Do not lie to a patient of this age. It is very hard to regain lost trust. The patient may be easily distracted by games or a toy or conversation. You should begin your assessment at their feet and move toward the head. You can use adhesive bandages to cover the site of an injection or other small wound, and this is helpful so that they don't see it. Modesty is developing, so keep the child covered as much as possible. Six to 12 year olds, the school age child. Children at this age are beginning to act more like adults. They can think in concrete terms and they can respond sensibly to questions. They can help take care of themselves as well. School is important at this stage and concerns about popularity and peer pressure begin. Children with chronic illnesses or disabilities can become self-conscious about fitting in. At this stage, children begin to understand death, 
which may increase anxiety about illness and injury. To assess the school-aged child, it's more like an adult assessment beginning with this age group. You should talk to them, not just the caregiver. Start with their head and work toward their feet, as you would in an adult assessment. If possible, give the child choices. For example, would you like to sit up or lie down? Would you like to take off your clothes yourself? Ask only the type of questions that let you control the answer. For example, would you like me to take the blood pressure on your right arm or your left arm? You can allow the child to listen to his or her own heartbeat through a stethoscope. These children can understand the difference between physical and emotional pain, and you should give them simple explanations about what is causing their pain and what will be done about it. Ask the parents or caregivers advice about which distraction works best. Adolescents, from 12 to 18. Most adolescents are able to think abstractly and can participate in decision making. Their personal morals begin to develop and they are able to discriminate between what is right and what is wrong. They are also able to incorporate their own values and beliefs into their daily decision making process. Physically, they're similar to adults, but they are still children, children on the emotional level. Gradually, they shift from relying on family to relying on friends for psychological support, social development, and acceptance from peers. Their interest in romantic relationships begins. This is also the stage when puberty begins, and this may make the adolescent very concerned about body image and appearance. They may have very strong feelings about being observed during procedures. This is also a time of experimentation and risk-taking. Adolescents often feel indestructible and they struggle with independence, loss of control, body image, sexuality, and peer pressure. They may have mood swings or depression or when ill or injured may act younger than their age. As a caregiver, you should respect the adolescent's privacy. They can often understand very complex concepts and treatment options. You should provide them with information when they request it. You should allow adolescents to be involved in their own care and provide choices while lending guidance. An EMT of the same gender should perform the assessment, if at all possible. Allow the adolescent to speak openly and ask questions. Remember, risk-taking behaviors are very common at this age. Some of these risks can ultimately facilitate development and judgment and shape their identity as an adult, but they can also result in unintentional trauma, dangerous sexual practices, and teen pregnancy. You need to remember that female patients may be pregnant, and it is important to report this information to the receiving facility. Adolescents may not want parents to know this information, so you should try to interview them without the caregiver present if you suspect that a female patient or even a male patient is withholding information. The body of a child is growing and changing very rapidly during this period. These changes can create difficulties during assessment if you do not expect them. For example, children are more susceptible to blunt trauma because their head is proportionally larger than the adults. The anatomy of the pediatric airway is different from adults. It is smaller in diameter and shorter in length. Their lungs are smaller and their heart is higher in their chest. Their vocal cords are higher and positioned more anteriorly and the neck appears to be non-existent. As children develop, the neck, gets, the neck gets proportionally longer as the vocal cords and epiglottis achieve anatomically correct adult positions. The occiput is larger and rounder, which requires more careful positioning of the airway. The tongue is larger relative to the size of the mouth and, in more, and is in a more anterior location. The child's tongue can easily block the airway. The epiglottis is long and floppy and U-shaped, and in infants and toddlers it is larger than in adults. <coughs> Rings of cartilage in the trachea are less well developed and may easily collapse if the neck is flexed or hyperextended. The upper airway has a narrowing funnel shape compared to the cylinder shape of the lower airway. The diameter of the trachea in infants is about the same as a drinking straw. The airway is easily obstructed by secretions, blood, or swelling. Infants are nose breathers and may require suctioning and airway maintenance. Remember, a respiratory rate of 30 to 60 breaths per minute is normal for a newborn, and 12 to 20 is normal for a teenager. Children have an oxygen demand twice that of an adult. This higher demand, combined with a smaller oxygen reserve, increases their risk of hypoxia. The muscles of the diaphragm dictate the amount of oxygen the child inspires. Anything that places pressure on the abdomen of a young child can block the movement of the diaphragm and cause respiratory compromise. 
You must use caution when applying the straps of the spinal mobilization device because it may hinder their tidal volume. We're going to now watch this animation about the respiratory system in children. Breath sounds are more easily heard because of thinner chest walls and gastric distension can interfere with movement of the diaphragm and lead to hypoventilation. Muscle fatigue from breathing hard occurs quickly and may lead to respiratory failure. Respiratory problems are the leading cause of cardiopulmonary arrest in the pediatric population and failure to recognize and treat declining respiratory status will lead to death. During respiratory distress, the pediatric patient is working harder to breathe and will eventually go into respiratory failure. Respiratory failure occurs when the pediatric patient has exhausted all compensatory mechanisms and waste products collect leading to respiratory arrest. Respiratory arrest is a total shutdown of the respiratory system. As you watch this animation play, look at the difference in the movement of the chest and abdominal cavities in a patient who is breathing normally on the left and a patient who is breathing faster on the right. We'll do it again. The circulatory system. Remember, just like with the respiratory rate, pulse rates differ from adults. An infant's heart rate can be at 160 times or more per minute. This is the primary method the body uses to compensate for decreased perfusion. The ability of children to constrict their blood vessels also helps them compensate for decreased perfusion. Signs of vasoconstriction include weak distal pulses in the extremities, delayed capillary refill, and cool hands or feet. Pediatric patients are more dependent on the actual cardiac output of the heart, which is the amount of the blood being pumped out of the heart in a minute. And remember, the formula for cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. So the one minute has to do with the rate of pumping, and the stroke volume is the amount of blood in, in one contraction. Pediatric patients may be in shock despite normal blood pressure. It may only take a small amount of blood loss for the pediatric patient to go into shock. This chart on table 32.2 has the general pediatric pulse rates and it's a great study tool. The nervous system. Compared to the adult, the pediatric nervous system is immature, underdeveloped, and not well protected. The head to body ratio of an infant or young child is disproportionately larger and they are more prone to head injuries from falls or motor vehicle crashes. The occipital region of the head is larger, which increases the momentum of the head during a fall. The subarachnoid space is relatively smaller and that leaves less cushioning for the brain. The brain tissue and cerebral vasculature is fragile and prone to bleeding from shearing forces, such as during an incidence of shaken baby syndrome. Pediatric brains also require a higher amount of cerebral blood flow, oxygen, and glucose than the adult does. This means that the child's brain is at risk for secondary brain damage from hypotension and hypoxia. Spinal cord injuries are less common in the pediatric population. If the cord or the cervical spine is injured, it is more likely to be an injury to the ligaments because of a rapid movement of the neck. Altered mental status may result from hypoglycemia, hypoxia, seizures, or ingestion of drugs or alcohol. Parents or caregivers are an important source of information when you are doing your history taking. A pediatric patient with an altered mental status may appear sleepy, lethargic, combative, or even unresponsive to tactile stimulus. You should be diligent about assessing and managing their airway, and remember their larger tongues may cause obstruction. Abdominal muscles are less developed in pediatric patients and there is less protection from trauma. The liver, spleen, and kidneys are proportionally larger and situated more anteriorly, so they are prone to bleeding and injury. Because organs are positioned closer to each other, there is a higher risk for multiple organ injury caused by minimal direct impact. The signs and symptoms of abdominal injuries or complaints may be vague in nature and their abdominal walls are underdeveloped. Patients may not be able to pinpoint the exact site where they are having pain or discomfort and where it's originating from, but they will have complaints of diffuse tenderness. You need to take these complaints seriously and remember large amounts of bleeding may occur within the abdominal cavity without any sign of shock. 
Liver and splenic injuries are common in this age group, and they need to be monitored for signs and symptoms of shock, which include altered mentation, tachypnea, tachycardia, and bradycardia. Open growth plates of the musculoskeletal system allow bones to grow during childhood. As a result of these open growth plates, children's bones are softer and more flexible, and that makes them prone to stress fractures. Bone length discrepancies can occur if there is an injury to the growth plate, and it is important to immobilize sprains as well as strains. The bones of an infant's head are flexible and soft. Soft spots are located at the front and back, and these are referred to as fontanelles. Fontanelles will close at particular stages of development, and they are a useful assessment tool in infants. A fontanelle that is bulging can indicate increased intracranial pressure, while fontanelles that are sunken in can indicate dehydration. The thoracic cage in children is highly elastic and pliable because it is primarily composed of cartilaginous connective tissue. The ribs and vital organs are less protected by muscle and fat. Muscles and bones grow well into adolescence, and they are at adolescence are prone to fractures of the extremities. The younger the child, the more vulnerable the bone structures are to trauma. Sprains are uncommon because the ligaments are more developed than the larger lung bones. Femur fractures in the pediatric patient is rare, are rare, but a source of major blood loss if they do occur. Older children are prone to long bone fractures due to taking more risks during physical activity. The goal for care and treatment in this circumstance is to immobilize and stabilize injured extremities. The pediatric integumentary system differs in a few ways. The skin is thinner with less subcutaneous fat. There is a higher ratio of body surface area to body mass, and that can lead to larger fluid and heat losses. The composition of the skin is also thinner and tends to burn more deeply and easily with less exposure. Thermoregulatory systems in pediatric patients is immature. It makes this population more prone to hypothermic events, and they lack the ability to shiver from cold in order to generate heat. Infants and young children should be kept warm during transport, and the head should be covered to avoid heat loss. Without recognition and treatment of a hypothermic event, the patient may progress to an unconscious state and lapse into convulsive seizure activity. Patient assessment. We always follow the same steps. We do a scene size up. We perform a primary assessment. We take a history and do vital signs. We perform a secondary assessment, and we should always reassess. For pediatric patients, the scene size up assessment begins at the time of initial dispatch. You need to prepare yourself mentally for approaching and treating an infant or child. You need to plan for pediatric scene size up, pediatric equipment, and age appropriate physical assessment. If possible, collect the age and gender of the child, location of the scene, and nature of illness or mechanism of injury from dispatch. Ensure proper safety precautions have been taken. Note the position in which you find your patient and look for possible safety threats, including spilled toxins, open containers of alcohol, drug paraphernalia, weapons, or fire. Bring medications that could have been ingested by the patient to the emergency department. The patient may be a safety threat if they have an infectious disease. The next thing you should do is an environmental assessment. This will give you important information on your chief complaint, number of patients, mechanism or nature of injury or illness, and ongoing health risks. This includes an inspection of the physical environment and interactions with caregivers and family. For example, dangerous scene conditions and inappropriate statements from caregivers may lead you to suspect intentional types of injuries or abuse. It is imperative that you gather information regarding the mechanism of injury or the nature of the illness from the patient, the parent, the caregiver, or any bystanders. You should assume injury was significant enough to cause head and neck trauma. Full spinal protocols with a cervical collar should be performed if you suspect the mechanism to be severe. Remember to pad under the child's head and or shoulders to facilitate a neutral position for airway management. Performing the primary assessment. The first step is to form a general impression and specifically to the pediatric population we use an assessment tool called the Pediatric Assessment Triangle to um, evaluate the general impression. The PAT is a 15 to 30 second structured assessment tool that allows you to rapidly form a general impression without touching your patient. It consists of three elements and requires no equipment. These include appearance, which includes muscle tone and mental status, work of breathing, and circulation to skin. The following will help you use the PAT in your assessment. For appearance, you should note the level of consciousness or interactiveness and muscle tone. An infant or child with a normal level of consciousness will act appropriately for his or her age. They will exhibit good muscle tone and maintain good eye contact. 
Poor muscle tone or poor eye contact can mean an abnormal level of consciousness. The mnemonic tickles can help determine if the patient is sick. This stands for tone, interactiveness, consolability, look or gaze, and speech or cry. Work of breathing. Work of breathing increases as the body attempts to compensate for abnormalities in oxygenation and ventilation. Increased work of breathing may often manifest itself as tachypnea, abnormal airway noises, and retractions of the intercostal muscles of the sternum. Circulation to skin. When cardiac output fails, the body shunts blood from areas of lesser need, such as the skin, to areas of greater need, such as the organs. Pallor of the skin and mucous membranes may be seen in compensated shock. It may also be a sign of anemia or hypoxia. Skin modeling is another sign of poor perfusion. Cyanosis reflects a decreased level of oxygen in the blood and it is a late sign of respiratory failure or shock. You should never wait for the development of cyanosis before administering oxygen to your patient. Determine whether to stay or go. From your 15 to 30 second PAT assessment, you will decide if the pediatric patient is stable or requires urgent care. Basically what we're looking for, for here, whether it's a trauma or a medical emergency, is, is the patient sick or not sick. If the patient is unstable, assess the ABCs, treat any life threats, and transport immediately. If the patient is stable, continue with the remainder of the patient assessment process. Hands-on ABCs. Next, you will perform the hands-on ABC assessment. This includes airway breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. If the airway is open and patent, and the patient can adequately keep it that way, next assess respiratory adequacy. If your patient is unresponsive or has difficulty maintaining their airway, ensure that it is properly positioned and it is clear of mucus, vomitus, blood, and foreign bodies. If you have ruled out trauma, use the head tilt chin lift to open the airway. If trauma is suspected, use the jaw thrust. Always position the airway in the neutral sniffing position. There is a skill drill for this, 32-1. This keeps the trachea from kinking, maintains proper alignment should you have to immobilize the spine, and it establishes whether the patient can maintain their own airway. Look, listen, and feel for breathing, and place both hands on the patient's chest to feel for the rise and fall of the chest wall. Belly breathing in infants is considered adequate because of the soft, pliable bones of the chest and the strong muscular diaphragm. While observing respiratory effort, you should note signs of increased work of breathing, and these include the following. Use of accessory muscles. This includes contractions of the muscles above the clavicles. Retractions. This occurs when the drawing in of muscles between the ribs or the sternum is evident during inspiration. Head bobbing. Head bobbing occurs, and you can recognize it, by the head lifting and tilting back during inspiration and moving forward during expiration. Nasal flaring. This is obvious by observing the nares where they widen. Tachypnea, which is an increased respiratory rate. Bradypnea, which is a decrease in respiratory rate, is an ominous sign, and it indicates impending respiratory arrest. You must determine if the patient has a pulse, is bleeding, or is in shock. This is part of your circulation assessment. Infants and children can tolerate only a small amount of blood loss before circulatory compromise occurs. In infants, palpate the brachial pulse or the femoral pulse. In children older than one year, palpate the carotid pulse. Strong central pulses usually indicate that the child is not hypotensive. Weak or absent peripheral pulses indicate decreased perfusion. Absence of a central pulse indicates the need for CPR. Tachypnea may be an early sign of hypoxia or shock, or a less serious condition such as fever, anxiety, pain, or excitement. You should interpret and in interpret the pulse within the context of the overall patient history. A trend of an increasing or decreasing pulse rate may suggest worsening hypoxia or shock or improvement after treatment. When hypoxia or shock becomes critical, bradycardia will occur. And in a pediatric patient, this often indicates impending cardiopulmonary arrest. Feel the skin for temperature and moisture and estimate cap refill time. Remember, cap refill time should be less than two seconds. Disability. We use the AFPU scale or the pediatric Glasgow coma scale to assess level of consciousness. Check the patient's pupillary response. And remember that normal pupils constrict after a light stimulus. This response may be abnormal in the presence of drugs, ongoing seizures, hypoxia, or brain injury. Look for symmetric movement of the extremities. Remember that pain is present with most types of injury but may be difficult to assess. 
inadequate treatment of pain has many adverse effects on the pediatric patient. Pain assessment must take into consideration the developmental age of the patient. The ability to recognize pain will improve as the patient becomes older. The Wong-Baker Faces Scale is helpful in assessing level of pain because it looks at your patient's facial expression as opposed to asking them a scale. Exposure. The pediatric assessment triangle is very helpful um, in assessment, but remember that you must remove some of the patient's clothing for observation, especially the face, the chest wall, and the skin. Be careful to avoid heat loss by covering the patient as soon as possible. Make your transport decision. Immediate transport to the hospital is indicated if any of the following conditions exist. A significant mechanism of injury with the addition of any fall from a height equal to or greater than a pediatric patient's height, especially with a head first landing. Bicycle crashes. A history compatible with a serious illness. A physiologic abnormality noted during the primary assessment. A potentially serious anatomic abnormality. Significant pain. A level of consciousness that is not normal for the pediatric patient. Altered mental status or signs and symptoms of shock. You should also consider the following when making a transport decision the type of clinical problem, the expected benefits of ALS treatment in the field, the local EMS system treatment and transport protocols, and the comfort level of yourself as the EMT. Also consider transport time to the hospital. If the patient's condition is non-urgent, get a history and perform a secondary assessment on scene. Pediatric patients weighing less than 40 pounds should be transported in a car seat. A seat should be chosen to fit the appropriate weight of the pediatric patient. To mount a car seat to a stretcher, you should place the head of the stretcher in an upright position. Place the car seat so that it is against the back of the stretcher and secure one of the stretcher straps from the upper portion of the stretcher through the seat belt portions of the car seat and strap it tightly to the stretcher. Repeat this on the lower portion of the stretcher. Push the car seat into the stretcher tightly and reattach or retighten the straps. You should follow the seat manufacturer's instructions to secure a car seat to the captain's chair. Children younger than one year must be transported in a rear-facing position because of the lack of neck muscles. In the cases of spinal immobilization or cardiopulmonary arrest, it is not appropriate to secure a patient in a car seat. Take your history. Investigate your chief complaint. Your approach to the history will depend on the age of the patient. Historic information for an infant, toddler, or school-aged child will have to be obtained from the parent or caregiver. When dealing with an adolescent, most information is actually coming from your patient. Remember that sexual activity, possible possibilities of pregnancy, and drug or alcohol use should be obtained in private with the patient's caregivers not in attendance. Questioning of the parents or child about the immediate illness or injury should be based on what the child's chief complaint is. When you interview the parent or caregiver or an old, older child about the chief complaint, obtain the following. Nature of the illness or mechanism of injury, how long the pediatric patient has been sick or injured, the key events that led to the injury or illness, the presence of fever, the effects of the illness or injury on the patient's behavior, their activity level, and any recent eating, drinking, and urine output. Also, ask about change in bowel or bladder habits, the presence of vomiting, diarrhea, or abdominal pain, and any presence of rash. Obtain the name and phone number of caregivers if they are not able to come to the hospital with you. Get your sample history. You use the same format as an adult. The questions should be based on the patient's age and developmental stage of life. Perform a physical exam as part of your secondary assessment. The full body scan should be used when patients have the potential for hidden illnesses or injuries. For example, if they are unresponsive or have a significant mechanism, and you would check for DCAP BTLS. A focused assessment should be performed on pediatric patients without life-threatening illnesses or injuries. Focus your physical exam on the areas of the body affected by illness or injury. Infants, toddlers, and preschool aged children should be assessed starting at the feet and ending at the head. School-aged children and adolescents can be assessed using the head-to-toe approach. The elements of the physical exam may include the following. For the head, the younger the patient, the larger the head is in proportion to the rest of the body. You should look for bruising, swelling, and hematomas, and remember that there is significant amounts of blood loss that can occur between the skull and scalp of an infant. Assessing the fontanelle may suggest elevated intracranial pressures caused by meningitis, encephalitis, or intracranial bleeding. If the fontanelle is sunken, it suggests dehydration. 
Young infants prefer to breathe through their nose, so nasal congestion with mucus can cause respiratory distress. Gentle bulb or catheter suction of the nose may bring relief. Look for drainage from the ear canals and remember that leaking blood suggests a skull fracture. Check for bruises behind the ears, referred to as battle sign. Remember, this is a late sign of a skull fracture. The presence of pus may indicate an ear infection or perforation of the eardrum. In the trauma patient, look for active bleeding and loose teeth in the mouth and note the smell of the breath. Examine the trachea for swelling or bruising and note if the pediatric patient cannot move their neck and if they have a high fever as this may indicate either bacterial or viral meningitis. Examine the chest for penetrating injuries, lacerations, bruises, or rashes and if the patient is injured, feel the clavicles in every rib for tenderness or deformity. Inspect the back for lacerations, penetrating injuries, bruises, or rashes. Inspect the abdomen for distension. Gently palpate the abdomen and watch for guarding or tensing of abdominal muscles, which could suggest infection, obstruction, or intra-abdominal injury. Note any tenderness or masses and look for seat belt abrasions. Assess the extremities for symmetry and compare both sides for color, warmth, size of the joints, swelling, and tenderness. Put each joint through a full range of motion while watching the eyes for signs of pain. Some of the guidelines used to assess adult circulatory status have important limitations in pediatric patients. Normal heart rates vary with age in pediatric patients and blood pressure is not usually assessed in patients under the age of three. It offers little information about circulatory status and it is difficult to obtain. Assessment of the skin is the best indication of the patient's circulatory status. When equipment is used, it is important to, appropriately, to use appropriately sized equipment when assessing a pediatric patient's vital signs. To obtain accurate blood pressure readings, use a cuff that covers two-thirds of the pediatric patient's upper arm. And remember that a cuff that is too small will give a false high reading and a cuff that is too large will give a false low reading. This also applies to adult patients. The formula 70 plus 2 times the patient's age in years equals the systolic blood pressure is a useful tool to determine blood pressure in children between the ages of 1 and 10. You should count respirations for at least 30 seconds and then double that number. In infants and children younger than 3, you evaluate respirations by actually watching, assess, watching the rise and fall of the abdomen. You assess the pulse rate by counting for at least a minute, noting quality and regularity. Normal vital signs in the pediatric patients vary with age. Assess respirations and impulse, and assess blood pressure last if you are going to. And always warm your stethoscope before placing it on the patient's skin. Evaluate the pupils in a child using a small pen light, and be sure to compare the pupil size right to left. Use appropriate monitoring devices. It is recommended that you obtain the patient's first blood pressure manually with a blood pressure cuff and a stethoscope. A pulse oximeter is a valuable tool to measure oxygen saturation in a pediatric patient with respiratory problems. Repeat your primary assessment. You should obtain vital signs every 15 minutes for a child in stable condition and every 5 minutes if your child is unstable. Continue monitoring respiratory effort, skin color, and condition and level of consciousness or interactiveness, and you should frequently reassess vital signs and temperature. Always consider getting help from the parent or caregiver of the patient, and they are usually able to calm and reassure the child. Communicate and document all relevant information to receiving staff at the hospital. We're next going to talk about specific pediatric emergencies and management. Respiratory illnesses were among the top 10 reasons for emergency department visits in children younger than 17 in the U.S. Asthma is the most common cause of respiratory emergencies in children, and foreign bodies and trauma can also cause respiratory emergencies. Some of the signs and symptoms of increased work of breathing include nasal flaring, grunting respirations, wheezing, strider, and other abnormal sounds, accessory intercostal muscle use, retractions or movements of the child's flexible rib cage, and in older children, assuming the tripod position. As the pediatric patient progresses to possible respiratory failure, their efforts to breathe decrease, the chest rises less with, ins less with inspiration, the body has used up all its available energy stores and cannot continue to support the extra work of breathing, and cyanosis may develop. Changes in behavior will also occur until the pediatric patient reaches an altered level of consciousness. The patient may also experience apnea,
As the lack of oxygen becomes more serious, the heart muscle becomes hypoxic and slows down. This leads to bradycardia. This is almost always an ominous sign in the pediatric population. If the heart rate is slow, below 60, you should begin CPR immediately. This will quickly progress to cardiopulmonary arrest without intervention. Respiratory failure does not always indicate an airway obstruction. It may indicate trauma, nervous system problems, dehydration, or metabolic disturbances. A pediatric patient's condition can progress from respiratory distress to respiratory failure at any time. You must reassess the pediatric patient frequently. A child or infant in respiratory distress needs supplemental oxygen, and you should allow the pediatric patient to remain in a comfortable position, usually in the lap of a caregiver or parent. Children can obstruct their airway with any object that can fit in their mouth. In cases of trauma, the teeth may have been dislodged into the airway. Blood, vomit, or other secretions can also cause mild or severe airway obstruction. Infections, including pneumonia, croup, epiglottitis, and bacterial tracheitis can also cause airway obstruction. Croup is an infection in the airway below the level of the vocal cords, and it is usually caused by a virus. Epiglottis. I'm sorry, epiglottitis is an infection of the soft tissue in the area above the vocal cords. You can see here a picture of a child with epiglottitis. And also, you see the swollen epiglottis and the swollen larynx. Infection should be considered as a possible airway obstruction if the child has congestion, fever, drooling, and cold symptoms. Obstruction by a foreign object may involve the upper or lower airway. Signs and symptoms frequently associated with an upper airway obstruction include decreased or absent breath sounds in stridor, and stridor is usually caused by swelling of the area surrounding the vocal cords or upper airway obstruction. Signs and symptoms of a lower airway obstruction include wheezing or crackles. Wheezing is a whistling sound caused by air traveling through the narrowed air passages within the bronchioles. Crackles are caused by the flow of air through liquid, and they are present in the air pouches and smaller airways in the lungs. The best way to auscultate breath sounds in the pediatric patient is to listen on both sides of the chest at the level of the armpit. The treatment of a pediatric patient with an airway obstruction must begin immediately. If the patient is conscious and coughing forcefully and someone saw him or her ingest a foreign object, encourage the child to cough to clear the airway. If this does not remove the object, do not intervene except to provide supplemental oxygen. Allow the patient to remain in whatever position is most comfortable and monitor his or her condition. Clear the airway immediately if you see any of the following signs of a severe airway obstruction. Ineffective cough with no sounds, inability to speak or cry, increased respiratory difficulty with stridor, cyanosis, or a loss of consciousness. Use the head tilt chin lift and finger sweep to remove a visible foreign body in an unconscious pediatric patient. Chest compressions are recommended to relieve a severe airway obstruction in an unconscious pediatric patient. And remember, this increases pressure in the chest, which creates an artificial cough that may force a foreign body from the airway. Asthma. Asthma is an acute spasm of the bronchioles associated with excessive mucus production and with swelling of the mucus lining of the respiratory passages. One of the most common illnesses seen by EMS providers in the pediatric population, and it affects almost 5 million children in the United States annually. Common causes for an asthma attack include upper respiratory infection, exercise, cold air exposure, emotional stresses, and passive exposure to smoke. A true emergency is not promptly identified and treated in the patient with asthma. Signs and symptoms include characteristic wheezing as patients attempt to exhale through partially obstructed lower air passages. In other cases, the airway is so blocked that no air passes through. Cyanosis and respiratory arrest may quickly develop. The tripod position allows easier breathing for the patient, and if possible, let them assume a position of comfort in a parent's lap. To treat a pediatric patient with asthma, you should administer supplemental oxygen via a route that the child tolerates. A bronchiodilator via a metered dose inhaler with a spacer may mask with a spacer mask device may be administered based on your local protocol. Often the parents or caregivers have attempted multiple dosages of albuterol inhalers, and in this case, you need to meet ALS providers en route for advanced care. If you must assist ventilations, use slow, gentle breaths and resist the temptation to squeeze the reservoir bag hard and fast. 
A prolonged, unrelieved asthma attack may progress into status asthmaticus. It is a true emergency, and the patient must be given oxygen and transported immediately to the ER. If the patient becomes exhausted from trying to breathe, he or she is not recovering and is likely to stop breathing. You need to manage their airway aggressively, administer oxygen, and provide rapid prompt transport. An ALS support should be considered. Pneumonia. According to the World Health Organization, pneumonia is the leading cause of death in children worldwide. Pneumonia is a general term that refers to an infection in the lungs, and it is often a secondary infection, meaning it begins after an upper respiratory infection such as a cold or sore throat. It can also occur from chemical ingestion or a direct lung injury from near drowning. Diseases causing immunodeficiency in children also increase the predisposal for pneumonia. The incidence is greatest during fall and winter months. Pediatric patients generally present with pneumonia as follows. They may have unusual rapid breathing or they will breathe with grunting or wheezing sounds. They may present with nasal flaring, tachypnea, crackles, hypothermia or fever, and unilateral diminished breath sounds. Treatment of pneumonia in a pediatric patient is generally supportive. You should monitor their airway and breathing status and administer supplemental oxygen if required. Remember, the diagnosis of pneumonia must be made in the hospital. Bronchiolitis. Bronchiolitis is a specific viral illness of newborns and toddlers and it is often caused by RSV. It causes inflammation of the bronchioles and RSV is a highly contagious disease and is spread through coughing and sneezing. The virus can survive on surfaces and it tends to spread lap rapidly through schools and in child care centers. It's more common in premature infants and results in copious secretions that may require suctioning. It generally occurs during the first two years of life and is more common in males, and it is most widespread in the winter and early spring. You should look for signs of dehydration, shortness of breath, and fever. To treat the patient with bronchiolitis, you need to display a calm demeanor when approaching. Allow the patient to remain in a position of comfort, treat airway and breathing problems as appropriate, and humidified oxygen will be helpful if you have it available. You should also consider ALS backup. Airway adjuncts. Adjuncts are devices that help maintain an airway or assist in providing artificial ventilation, and just as in adults, these include oral and nasal airways, bite blocks, and bag masks. Oral airways are designed to keep the tongue from blocking the airway and make suctioning easier. It should be used for pediatric patients who are unconscious and in possible respiratory failure. It should not be used in conscious patients or in anyone who has a gag reflex. The nasal airway is usually well tolerated and not likely to cause vomiting. It is used for conscious patients or those who have altered levels of consciousness. It can be used in association with possible respiratory failure, but it is rarely used in infants under one year. It should not be used in pediatric patients with nasal obstruction or head trauma. Some of the potential problems of nasal airway insertion include that the small diameter of the tube may become clogged with mucus, blood, vomitus, or the soft tissues of the pharynx. If it's too long, it may stimulate the vagus nerve and slow the heart rate, or enter the esophagus and cause gastric distension. It may cause a spasm of the larynx and result in vomiting if inserted into a responsive patient. Oxygen delivery devices. When you treat infants and children who require more than the usual 21% oxygen found in room air, you have several options. Blow-by technique at 6 liters a minute provides more than 21% oxygen concentration. Nasal cannula at 1 to 6 liters a minute provides 24 to 44% oxygen concentration. And non-rebreathing masks at 10 to 15 liters a minute provide up to 90% oxygen concentration. The bag mask device at 10 to 15 liters a minute provides 90% oxygen concentration or more. The use of a non-rebreathing mask, a nasal cannula, or a simple face mask is indicated only for pediatric patients who have adequate respirations and or adequate tidal volume. Children with respirations less than 12 or more than 60, altered levels of consciousness, or inadequate tidal volume should receive assisted ventilations in a bag mask. The blow-by method. The blow-by method is not nearly as effective as a face mask or nasal cannula for delivering oxygen. It does not provide high concentrations of oxygen, but it's better than none at all. There are several ways that you can do this procedure. One of the ways is to place oxygen tubing through a small hole in the bottom of a 6 to 8 ounce cup and connect the tubing to an oxygen source set at 6 liters a minute. You can hold the cup approximately 1 to 2 inches away from the child's nose and mouth. You can also do this with a non-rebreather mask. Nasal cannula. 
Some pediatric patients prefer the nasal cannula, others find it uncomfortable. To apply it, you choose the appropriately sized pediatric nasal cannula. The prongs should not entirely fill the nares and connect the tubing to the source set at 1 to 6 liters a minute. This picture shows you an example of blow-by technique on the left and a nasal cannula on the right. Non-rebreathers. Non-rebreathers deliver up to 90% oxygen to pediatric patients and allow them to exhale all carbon dioxide without rebreathing it. To apply it, you select the appropriately sized pediatric non-rebreather mass and it should extend from the bridge of the nose to the cleft of the chin. Connect the tubing to an oxygen source set between 10 and 15 liters a minute and adjust oxygen flow as needed to match the respiratory rate and depth. Bag mask devices. Bag mask devices are indicated for pediatric patients who have respirations that are either too slow or too fast, who are unresponsive, or who do not respond in a purposeful way to painful stimuli. Assisting ventilation using a bag mask device. Ensure that you have the appropriate equipment in the right size. The mask should extend from the bridge of the nose to the cleft of the chin. You should maintain a good seal with the mask on the face and ventilate at the appropriate rate and volume using a slow, gentle squeeze. Stop squeezing and begin to release the bag as soon as the chest wall begins to rise, indicating that the lungs are filled to capacity. To perform one rescue or bag mask device ventilation, you will see skill drill 32-4. Here you see a picture of a child using a non-rebreather mask on the left and performing bag mask ventilations on a child on the right. The two rescue or bag mask bag mask ventilation technique. It is similar to one rescuer except that one rescuer holds the mask to the patient's face and maintains the head position and the other will ventilate. It's usually more effective in maintaining a tight seal and you can use your thumb and index finger to gently ap apply pressure over the area just below the Adam's apple. This will decrease the risk of gastric distension and aspiration of vomitus. Cardiopulmonary arrest. Infants and children in cardiac arrest is most often associated with respiratory failure in arrest. Children are affected differently than adults when it comes to decreasing oxygen concentrations. Adults become hypoxic and the heart gets irritable and sudden cardiac death occurs from the arrhythmia. This is often in the form of ventricular fibrillation and the AED is the treatment of choice. Children become hypoxic and their heart rate slows and it becomes more bradycardic. The heart beats slower with each beat until no pulse is left. The pre-hospital survival rate from cardiac arrest in the pediatric population is 3 to 5%. The pre-hospital survival rate from respiratory arrest is 75%. A child who is breathing very poorly with a slowing heart rate must be ventilated with high concentrations of oxygen early to prevent cardiac arrest. Shock is a condition that develops when the circulatory system is unable to deliver a sufficient amount of oxygen and blood to the body. This results in organ failure and eventually cardiopulmonary arrest. Compensated shock is the early stage when the body can still compensate for the blood loss. Decompensated shock is the later stage when the blood pressure is fallen. In pediatric patients, the most common causes of shock include traumatic injury with blood loss. This is especially true in the abdominal area dehydration from diarrhea or vomiting, severe infections, neurologic injuries such as severe head trauma, a severe allergic reaction or anaphylaxis to an allergen, and this can be from an insect bite or food allergy, heart disease, collapsed lungs like a pneumothorax, also blood or fluid around the heart like cardiac tamponade and pericarditis. Infants and children have less blood circulating than adults, so even a small amount of loss may lead to shock. Pediatric patients also respond dif differently than adults do to fluid loss. They may respond by increasing their heart rate, increasing respirations, and showing signs of pale or blue skin. Signs of shock in children are as follows, tachycardia, poor capillary refill time greater than two seconds, and mental status changes. In assessing circulation, pay attention to the following. Assess the rate and quality of pulses. A weak thready pulse is a sign of a problem. Anything over 160 beats a minute suggests shock. Assess temperature and moisture of the hands and feet. Remember, a two second capillary refill time is normal. Assess skin color. Any change in pulse rate, color, skin signs, and cap refill time are all important clues suggesting shock. 
Blood pressure is difficult to measure in the pediatric population. The cuff must be the proper size and the blood pressure may be normal with compensated shock. Low blood pressure is a sign of decompensated shock and it requires ALS care and immediate transport. Assessment should also include determining when the signs and symptoms first appeared and whether any of the following have occurred. Decrease in urine output, for example, with infants, are there are fewer than 6 to 10 wet diapers. Absence of tears, even when the child is crying. A sunken or depressed fontanelle in an infant. Changes in the level of consciousness and behavior. Ensure the airway is open and prepare for artificial ventilation. Control bleeding. Give supplemental oxygen by mask or blow-by and continue to monitor airway and breathing. Position the pediatric patient with the head lower than the feet by elevating the feet with blankets and keep the patient warm with blankets and by turning up the heat in the patient compartment. Provide immediate transport and contact ALS for assistance if needed. Anaphylactic shock. Anaphylaxis is a major allergic reaction that involves generalized multi-system response to an antigen. The airway and cardiovascular system are important sites of this potentially life-threatening reaction and common causes are an insect sting or a food allergy. Signs and symptoms of anaphylactic shock in the pediatric patient include hypoperfusion, strider or wheezing, increased work of breathing, altered appearance, restlessness, agitation, and sometimes a sense of impending doom and hives. Treatment includes maintaining the airway and administer oxygen however it's tolerated. If the patient is stable, allow the parent or caregiver to assist in positioning the patient, assist with their oxygen delivery, and keeping the patient calm. Based on protocol, if an epi auto injector is available, you can assist with it and provide tra transport promptly. Bleeding disorders. Hemophilia is a congenital condition in which patients lack one or more of the normal clotting factors in the blood. Most forms are hereditary and severe, and it's predominantly found in males. Bleeding may occur spontaneously, and all injuries become serious because the blood does not clot, and these patients require rapid transport. Altered mental status is an abnormal neurologic state in which the pediatric patient is less alert and interactive than it is age-appropriate. Understanding normal developmental or age-related changes in behavior and listening carefully to the caregiver's op opinions are key. The mnemonic AEIOU tips reflects the major causes of altered mental status, and those are found in Table 3210 on your slide and in your text. These include alcohol, epilepsy, endocrine, and electrolytes, insulin, opiates, and other drugs, uremia, trauma, or temperature, infection, psychogenic, poison, shock, stroke, space-occupying lesions, and subarachnoid hemorrhage. The signs and symptoms vary from simple confusion to coma, and management focuses on ABCs and support. If the patient's level of consciousness is decreased, they may not be able to protect their airway, and you should ensure their airway is patent and adequate breathing is occurring through a non-rebreathing mask or bag mask device. Seizures. A seizure is the result of the disorganized electrical activity in the brain. Some of the common causes include child abuse, electrolyte imbalances, fever, hypoglycemia, infection, ingestion, lack of oxygen, medications, poisoning, seizure disorder, recreational drug use, and head trauma, as well as idiopathic where there's no cause found. Seizures may manifest in a variety of ways depending on the child's age, and in infants they can be very subtle, consisting only of an abnormal gaze, sucking motions, or bicycling motions. In older children, seizures become more obvious and typically consist of repetitive muscle contractions and unresponsiveness. Once the seizure stops, the patient's muscles relax, become, um, becoming almost flaccid or floppy, and the breath becomes labored. This is called the postictal state. The longer or more intense the seizures are, the longer it will take for this imbalance to correct itself. Once the pediatric patient regains a normal level of consciousness, the postictal state is over. Seizures that continue every few minutes without regaining consciousness or last longer than 30 minutes are referred to as status epilepticus. 
recurring or prolonged seizures should be considered potentially life-threatening. If the patient does not regain consciousness or continues to seize, protect the patient from harming himself or herself and call for ALS backup. These patients need advanced airway management and medication to stop the seizure. The priority in management of seizures is to secure and protect the airway. Position the head to open it, clear the mouth with suction, consider placing the patient in the recovery position if, if they are vomiting and suctioning is inadequate. Provide 100% oxygen by non-rebreather mask or use the blow-by technique. And it, you should begin BVM ventilations if there's no sign of improvement. Febrile seizures are common in children between the ages of 6 months and 6 years. Most pediatric seizures are the result of fever alone, which is why they are called febrile seizures. They typically occur on the first day of the febrile illness, and they are characterized by generalized tonic-clonic seizure activity. There will be a rhythmic back-and-forth motion of an extremity, and the body will become stiff. They generally last less than 15 minutes with little or no postictal state. It may be a sign of a more serious problem, such as meningitis. You should assess ABCs, provide cooling measures with tepid water, and provide prompt transport. All patients experiencing febrile seizures need to be seen in the hospital setting. Meningitis is an inflammation of the tissue, the meninges, that covers the spinal cord in the brain. It's caused by an infection by bacteria, viruses, fungi, or parasites. If it's left untreated, it can lead to brain damage and death. Being able to recognize a pediatric patient with meningitis is an important skill to have. Some individuals are at greater risk, and these include males, newborns, the geriatric population, and anyone with a comprised immune system by AIDS or cancer. Also, those who have a history of brain, spinal cord, or back surgery, children who have had head trauma, children with shunts, pins, or other foreign bodies within their brain or spinal cord, and especially children who have VP shunts. These are called ventriculoperitoneal shunts. Some of the signs and symptoms vary depending on the age of the patient. Fever and an altered LOC are common. Changes in the level of consciousness can range from a mild or severe headache to confusion, lethargy, or an inability to understand commands or interact appropriately. They may also experience a seizure, which may be the first sign of meningitis. In infants younger than two to three months, you may see apnea, cyanosis, fever, and a distinct high-pitched cry, or even hypothermia. Meningeal irritation or meningeal signs are terms used by doctors to describe the pain that often accompanies movements. This can often result in characteristic stiff neck, and this one sign of meningitis in an infant is increasing irritability in a bulging fontanelle without crying. Neisseria meningitis is a bacterium that causes a rapid onset of meningitis symptoms, often leading to shock and death. Children with this infection typically have small pinpoint cherry red spots on, or a large purple-black rash on the face or body. These children are at serious risk of sepsis, shock, and death. And here is a picture. You should use standard precautions when dealing with pediatric patients with possible meningitis because they are highly contagious and, effective, and infectious. If exposed to their saliva or respiratory secretions, you should receive antibiotics. And to treat a child with suspected meningitis, you should provide supplemental oxygen and assist with ventilations if needed. Reassess vital signs frequently during transport to the highest level of service available. GI emergencies and management. Complaints of gastrointestinal origin are very common in the pediatric population. It may be from ingestion of certain foods or unknown substances, and in most cases, the pediatric patient will be experiencing abdominal discomfort with nausea, vomiting, and or diarrhea. This can cause dehydration. Appendicitis is also a possibility, and if left untreated, it can lead to peritonitis or shock. Peritonitis is inflammation of the peritoneum, which lines the abdominal cavity. It will typically present with a fever and pain on palpation of the right lower abdominal quadrant, and rebound tenderness is a common sign associated with this problem. If you suspect appendicitis, transport to the hospital for further care. Obtain a thorough history from the primary care caregiver. In particular, the questions you should ask is, how many wet diapers has the child had today? Is your child tolerating liquids or is he, he or she able to keep them down? How many times has your child had diarrhea and for how long? And when he or she cries, are tears present? Poisoning emergencies are very common in children and they can occur by ingestion, inhalation, injection, or absorption. Common sources of poisoning include alcohol, aspirin, and acetaminophen, 
household cleaning products such as bleach and furniture polish, and house plants. Also iron, prescription medications of family members, street drugs, and vitamins. Signs and symptoms of poisoning vary widely depending on the substance and the age and weight of the child. The patient may appear normal at first or may be confused, sleepy, or unconscious. You should be alert for signs of abuse. After you have completed your primary assessment, ask the parent or caregiver the following. What is the substance involved? Approximately how much of it was ingested or involved in the exposure? What time did the incident occur? And are there any changes in behavior or level of consciousness? Was there any choking or coughing after the exposure? Treatment of a poisoned pediatric patient. First, you perform decontamination. Remove tablets or fragments from their mouth and wash or brush, brush poison from the skin. Assess and maintain airway breathing and circulation and provide oxygen and perform ventilations if necessary. If the child demonstrates shock, position them supine and keep them warm and transport. In some cases, give activated charcoal according to medical control or local protocol. It is not indicated for pediatric patients who have ingested an acid, an alkali, or a petroleum product. It is also not recommended in patients with a decreased level of consciousness who cannot protect their own airway or are unable to swallow. Some common trade names for the suspension form are Instachar, Actidose, and Liquichar. The usual dose for a child is one gram of activated charcoal per kilogram of body weight. Dehydration emergencies and management. Dehydration occurs when fluid losses are greater than intake. Vomiting and diarrhea are the most common causes of dehydration in the pediatric population, and if left untreated, it can lead to shock and death. Infants and children are at a greater risk than adults for dehydration because their fluid reserves are smaller than those in the adults. Life-threatening dehydration can overcome an infant in a matter of hours. It can be mild, moderate, or severe. Some of the signs of mild dehydration include dry lips and gums, decreased saliva, and few wet diapers. For moderate dehydration, it includes sunken eyes, sleepiness, irritability, and loose skin. And severe dehydration, cool, clammy skin, delayed capillary refill, increased respirations, and sunken fontanelles. To treat a dehydrated pediatric patient, assess the ABCs, obtain baseline vital signs, and if dehydration is severe, ALS backup may be necessary for IV access. Transport to the emergency department if signs are moderate to severe. You can see here what they're doing is checking how much skin is loose on the baby's head, and this is a very common um, sign of dehydration. Fever emergencies and management. Simply defined, a fever is an increase in body temperature, usually in response to an infection. The temperature of 100.4 or higher is considered abnormal. Fever is rarely life-threatening, but with a rash, it can be a sign of a serious condition such as meningitis. Some common causes of fever in the pediatric population includes infection, status epilepticus, neoplasms or cancers, and drug ingestion of aspirin. Also arthritis, systemic lupus erythematosus, which is a rash across the nose, high environmental temperature is also a cause. Fever is the result of an internal body mechanism in which heat generation is increased and heat loss is decreased. An accurate body temperature is an important vital sign in the pediatric population. A rectal temperature is the most accurate for infants to toddlers. Older children will be able to follow directions for placing a thermometer under the tongue or arm. Depending on the source of the infection, the pediatric patient may present with signs of respiratory distress, shock, a stiff neck, a rash, skin that is hot to the touch, flushed cheeks, seizures, and an infant's bulging fontanelles. You should assess this patient for other signs and symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, decreased feedings, and headache, and transport and manage ABCs. Follow standard precautions if you expect there's the presence of communicable disease. Drowning emergencies and management. In drowning emergencies, you must always take steps to ensure your own safety. It is the second most common cause of unintentional death among children in the United States, and generally, children younger than five are at particular risk. Older adolescents who account for the most drownings after toddlers drown when swimming or boating, and alcohol is generally a factor. The principal condition that results from drowning is lack of oxygen. Even a few minutes without oxygen affects the heart, lungs, and the brain, and it causes life-threatening problems such as cardiac arrest, respiratory difficulty, and coma. Submersion in icy water can rob the body of heat, causing hypothermia, and most people in this situation die. If a child demonstrates signs of shock, keep them warm and transport promptly. Remember that diving into water increases the risk of neck and spinal cord injuries. 
Signs and symptoms will vary based on the type and length of the submersion. These include coughing, choking, airway obstruction, difficulty breathing, altered mental status, seizures, unresponsiveness, fast, slow, or absent pulse, pale cyanotic skin, and distension of the abdomen. Safety is critical in managing a drowning emergency. Don't become a victim yourself. Assess and manage ABCs and contact ALS to intervene if needed. Administer 100% oxygen via a non-rebreather mask or a bag mask device if you need to assist with ventilations. If you suspect trauma, apply a cervical collar and place the patient on a longboard. Pad all open spaces under the pediatric patient before securing them to a board and perform CPR on unresponsive patients in cardiopulmonary arrest. Trauma is the number one killer of children in the United States. More children die of injuries in one year than of all other causes combined. Quality of care in the first few minutes after a child has been injured can have an enormous impact on the child's chances for recovery. Infants and toddlers are most commonly hurt as a result of falls or abuse. Older children and adolescents are usually injured as a result of mishaps involving automobiles. Automobile accidents, including those involving bicycles and pedestrians, are most significant threat to the well-being of the child. Other common causes of traumatic injury and death include gunshot wounds, blunt injuries, sports activities, and child abuse. Regarding trauma, as well as any medical emergency with a child, remember that they're smaller than adults and therefore the location of injuries may differ from that of an adult for the same type of accident. Their bones and soft tissues are less well developed than those of an adult and therefore the force of an injury affects these structures differently. Because a child's head is proportionally larger than an adult's, it exerts greater stress on the neck structures during a deceleration injury. Children are often injured because of their underdeveloped judgment and their lack of experience. Always assume the child has serious head or neck injuries. Some of, some of the things that cause children to be injured include their inability to remember to do things like not looking both ways before crossing the street or forgetting to check the depth of the water before diving. It is important for the EMT to understand the special physical and psychological characteristics of children and what makes them more likely to have certain kinds of injuries. In vehicle collisions, children playing or riding a bicycle can dart out in front of motor vehicles without looking, and the area of greatest injury varies depending on the size of the child and the height of the bumper at the time of impact. Children involved in these types of injuries typically sustain high energy injuries to the head, spine, abdomen, pelvis, and legs. Children, especially those who are older or adolescent, are often injured in organized sporting events. Head and neck injuries can occur after high-speed collisions in contact sports such as football, wrestling, ice hockey, field hockey, soccer, or lacrosse. Remember to stabilize the C-spine when caring for children with sports-related injuries and be familiar with your local protocols for helmet removal. Injuries to specific body systems. Head injuries are common in children because the size of the child's head in relation to the body is larger than that of an adult. An infant also has a softer, thinner skull, which may result in injury to the brain tissue. The scalp and facial vessels can bleed very easily and may cause a great deal of blood loss if not controlled. Nausea and vomiting are common signs and symptoms of a head injury in a children. It is easy to mistake for abdominal injury or illness. You should suspect a serious head injury in any child who experiences nausea and vomiting after trauma. Immobilization is necessary for all children who have possible head or spinal injuries after a traumatic event. You should see Skill Drill 32-5 for this, as well as 32-6 for immobilization in a car seat. Immobilization can be difficult because of the child's body proportions. Young children require padding under the torso to maintain a neutral position, and between the ages of 9 and 10, they no longer require this padding under the torso. They can lie supine on the board. Padding may be needed along the sides so the child can properly be secured on an adult-sized longboard, and skill drills 32.6 and 32.7 will be helpful here. Usually the result of blunt rather than penetrating trauma are chest injuries. The chest wall flexibility in children can produce a flail segment, and keep this in mind as you assess a child who has sustained high-energy blunt trauma to the chest. 
Even though there may be no external sign of injury, there may be injuries within the chest. Pediatric patients are managed in the same manner as adults. Abdominal injuries are very common and children can compensate for significant blood loss better than adults without signs or symptoms of shock developing. Children can have a serious injury without early external evidence of a problem. All children with abdominal injuries should be monitored for signs and symptoms of shock, including weak rapid pulses, cold clammy skin, decreased capillary refill, confusion, and decreased systolic blood pressure. If the patient shows signs and symptoms of shock, you should prevent hypothermia by keeping them warm with blankets, and if the patient has bradycardia, they need to be ventilated with a bag valve mask device and high concentrations of oxygen. Monitor them during transport. Here we see pictures of specific differences between adults and children in developing shock. Burns to children are generally considered more serious than those to adults because they have more surface area related to total body mass, which means greater fluid and heat loss. Children also do not tolerate burns as well as adults do. They are also more likely to go into shock, develop hypothermia, and experience airway issues. The most common way in which children are burned are exposure to hot substances such as scalding water in the bathtub, hot items on a stove, exposure to caustic substances such as cleaning solvents or paint thinners. You should expect possible internal injuries when you see a child with burns around the mouth and face. Infection is a common problem following a burn injury in a child. Burned skin cannot resist infection as effectively as normal skin can, and sterile techniques should be used in handling the skin of children with burn wounds. You should consider the possibility of child abuse in any burn. Make sure you report any information about suspicions to the appropriate authorities. Burn severity. Minor, moderate, or critical. Minor burns are partial thickness burns involving less than 10% of the body surface. Moderate or partial thickness burns involving 10 to 20% of body surface. And critical or any full thickness burn, any partial thickness burn involving more than 20% of body surface or any burn that involves the hands, the feet, the face, the airway, or the genitals. We manage pediatric patients in the same manner as adults. If they are showing signs and symptoms of shock, we prevent hypothermia by keeping them warm. If the patient is bradycardic, we ventilate and we monitor during transport. Extremity injuries. Children have immature bones with active growth centers and growth of long bones occurs from the ends at specialized growth plates. These plates are potential weak spots and incomplete or green stick fractures can occur. Generally, extremity injuries in children are managed in the same manner as adults. If there are painful deformed limbs with evidence of broken bones, we should splint. Specialized splinting equipment should only be used if it actually fits the pediatric patient, and you should not attempt to use adult immobilization devices on pediatric patients unless the patient is large enough to properly fit. Regarding pain management as an EMT, you are limited to the following interventions, positioning, ice packs, and extremity elevation. These interventions will decrease the pain and swelling at the injury site. However, additional ALS interventions may be needed. Being kind and providing emotional support can go a long way in the treatment of the pediatric patient. Disaster management. The Jump Start triage system was developed for pediatric patients. It is intended for patients younger than 8 and weighing less than 100 pounds. There are four triage categories in Jump Start and they are designed by colors corresponding to the different levels of urgency. Decision points include able to walk except in infants. These are green, minor, and no, not in need of immediate treatment. Presence of spontaneous breathing with a peripheral pulse and appropriately responsive painful stimuli, they are yellow and treatment can be delayed. Respirations of less than 15 or greater than 45, apnea responsive to positioning or rescue breathing, respiratory failure, breathing but without a pulse, or inappropriate painful response. These are red and need immediate response. Apneic and without a pulse or apneic and unresponsive to rescue breathing are black and considered deceased or expectant deceased. Here is an example of the Jumpstart Pediatric MCI triage card and the decision points. Child abuse and neglect. Child abuse means any proper or excessive action that injures or otherwise harms a child or infant. This includes physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, and emotional abuse. More than 2 million cases of child abuse are reported annually and many of these children suffer life-threatening injuries and some die. If suspected child abuse is not reported, the abuse is likely to happen again, perhaps causing permanent injuries or even death. You must be aware of the signs of child abuse and neglect and it is your responsibility to report it to law enforcement or child protection agencies.
signs of abuse. As an EMT, you will be called to homes because of reported injury to a child. Child abuse occurs in every socioeconomic status, so you must be aware of the patient's surroundings and document your findings objectively. Ask yourself the following questions. Is the injury typical for the developmental level of the child? Is the mechanism reported consistent with the injury? Is the caregiver behaving appropriately? Is there evidence of drinking or drug use at the scene? Was there a delay in seeking care for the child? Is there a good relationship between the caregiver and the child? Does the child have multiple injuries at different stages of healing? Does the child have any unusual marks or bruises that may have been caused by cigarettes, grids, or branding injuries? Does the child have several types of injuries? Does the child have any burns on the hands or feet that involve a glove distribution? Is there any unexplained decreased level of consciousness? Is the child clean and at an appropriate weight for his or her age? Is there any rectal or vaginal bleeding? What does the home look like? Is it clean or dirty? Is it warm or cold? Is there food? The noonic child abuse may help you remember the points to look for, and you see these in Table 32.5. If you see bruises, you should observe the color and location. New bruises are generally pink or red, and over time they turn blue and purple, then green, then yellow-brown, and they fade. Note the location. Bruises to the back, buttocks, or face are suspicious and are usually inflicted by a person. Burns to the penis, testicles, vagina, or buttocks are usually inflicted by someone else. Burns that encircle a hand or foot and it looks like a glove are usually inflicted by someone else. You should suspect child abuse if the child has cigarette burns or grid pattern burns. Fractures of the humerus or femur do not normally occur with major trauma in children. Falls from a bed are not usually associated with fractures. You should maintain some index of suspicion if an infant or young child sustains a femur fracture. Shaken baby syndrome. Infants may sustain life-threatening head trauma by being shaken or struck in the head. This life-threatening condition is called shaken baby syndrome. There is bleeding within the head and damage to the cervical spine as a result of intentional forceful shaking. The infant will be found unconscious, often without evidence of external trauma. The infant may appear to be in cardiopulmonary arrest. Shaking tears the blood vessels in the brain and that results in bleeding around the brain. The pressure from the blood results in an increased ICP, and it leads to coma or death. Neglect. Neglect is the refusal or failure of the, on the part of the caregiver to provide life necessities. Examples are water, clothes, shelter, personal hygiene, medicine, comfort, and safety. Children who are neglected are often dirty or too thin or appear developmentally delayed because of a lack of stimulation. You may observe such children when you are making calls for unrelated problems, and you should report all suspected cases of neglect. And child abuse and neglect is mandatory reporting in Montana. Other symptoms and indicators of abuse. Abused children may appear withdrawn, fearful, or hostile. You should be concerned if the child does not want to discuss how an injury occurred, and occasionally the parent or caregiver will reveal a history of accidents. You should be alert for conflicting stories or a lack of concern from the caregiver, and the abuser may be a parent, caregiver, relative, or family friend. EMTs in all states must report suspected abuse. Most states have special forms to do so, and supervisors are generally forbidden to interfere with the reporting of suspected abuse. Law enforcement and Child Protection Services will determine whether any abuse occurred, and it is not your job to prove it. Sexual Abuse Children of any age and of either gender can be victims of sexual abuse. Most victims of rape are older than 10, and younger children may be victims as well. Your assessment should be limited to determining the type of dressing any injuries require, and you treat any bruises or fractures as well. Do not examine the genitalia of a young child unless there is evidence of bleeding or there is injury that must be treated. Do not allow the child to wash, urinate, or defecate before the physician completes the exam. This is a difficult step, but it is important for preservation of evidence. If the victim is a girl, you should ensure that a female EMT or police officer remains with the child unless locating one will delay transport. You need to maintain professional composure the entire time and assume a caring approach. Shield the child from onlookers and curious bystanders and obtain as much information as possible from the child or any witnesses. They may be hysterical or unwilling to talk, and you are in the best position to obtain the most accurate first-hand information. You should record any information carefully and completely on the patient care report and cooperate with law enforcement officials in their investigations. And remember, sexual abuse of a child is a crime. Sudden Infant Death Syndrome the death of an infant or a young child is called Sudden Infant Death Syndrome, or SIDS, when after a complete autopsy, the death remains unexplained. 
SIDS is the leading cause of death in infants under the age of one, and most cases occur in infants under the age of six months. Although it is impossible to predict, there are risk factors that are common with this occurrence, and they include mothers younger than 20, mothers who smoked during pregnancy, low birth weight children, death as a result of SIDS can occur at any time of the day. You will be faced with three tasks, assessment of the scene, assessment and management of the patient, and communication and support of the family. Patient assessment and management for SIDS. An infant who has been a victim of SIDS will be pale or blue, not breathing and unresponsive. Other causes for such a condition can include an overwhelming infection, child abuse, airway obstruction from a foreign object or the result of infection, meningitis, accidental or intentional poisonings, hypoglycemia, including low blood glucose levels, congenital metabolic defects, and you should begin with an assessment of the ABCs and provide interventions as necessary. Depending on how much time has passed, the patient may show signs of post-mortem changes such as stiffening of the body called rigor mortis, dependent lividity, which is pooling of the blood in the lower parts of the body, or those that are in contact with the floor bed. If a child shows these signs, call medical control. In some systems, a victim of SIDS may be declared dead on scene. Deciding whether to start CPR on a child with rigor mortis or dependent lividity can be very difficult because family members may consider anything less to be withholding critical care. The best solution may be to begin CPR and transport and family, transport the child and family to a local facility. If there is no sign of postmortem changes, begin CPR immediately. As you assess your patient, pay special attention to any marks or bruises on the child before performing procedures. Note any intervention that was done before your arrival. The sudden death of an infant can be very stressful for the family. It also tends to evoke strong emotional responses among health care providers. Part of your job at this point is to allow the family to express their grief. Family members may ask specific questions, and you should let them know that their concerns will be addressed, but that answers are not immediately available. Always use the infant's name and allow the family to spend time with the infant and to ride in the ambulance to the hospital. Carefully inspect the environment. Note the condition of the scene where the infant was found. Your assessment should concentrate on the following things. Signs of illness, including medications, humidifiers, or thermometers. The general condition of the house. Look for any signs of poor hygiene. Family interaction. Do not allow yourself to be judgmental about family interactions at this time. Do note and report any behavior that is clearly not within the acceptable range, such as physical and verbal abuse. The site where the infant was discovered. You should note all items in the crib or bed, including pillows, stuffed animals, toys, and small objects. Apparent life-threatening events or ALT. Infants who are not breathing and are cyanotic and unresponsive when found sometimes resume breathing and color with stimulation. These children have had what is called an ALT, an apparent life-threatening event. It's also called near-missed SIDS in the past. Classic ALT is characterized by cyanosis, apnea, a distinct change in muscle tone, and choking or gagging. After the event, the child may appear healthy and show no signs of illness or distress. You must still complete a careful assessment and provide transport to the emergency department. You should pay strict attention to airway management and assess the infant's history and environment. Allow caregivers to ride in the back of the ambulance and doctors will have to determine the cause. Death of a child. The death of a child from any cause poses special challenges for EMS personnel. In addition to medical care, you must provide the family with support and understanding. The family may insist on CPR even though the child is clearly deceased. If this is the case, initiate CPR and transport. Always introduce yourself and ask about the child's date of birth and medical history. Do not speculate on the cause of the child's death. Parents may be experiencing strong feelings of denial. The following interventions are helpful in caring for the family at this time. Learn to use the child's name rather than the impersonal, your child. Speak to family members at eye level, maintaining good eye contact. Use the word dead or died when informing the family member of the child's death. Euphemisms such as passed away or gone on are not effective. Acknowledge the family's feelings, but never say, I know how you feel. Offer to call other family members or clergy if the family wishes. Keep any instructions short, simple, and basic. Ask each adult family member individually if he or she wants to hold the child. Wrap the dead child in a blanket and stay with the family while they hold the child. Ask them not to remove tubes or other equipment that was used in an attempted resuscitation. Each individual in each culture expresses grief in different ways. Some require intervention. 
Most caregivers will feel directly responsible for a child's death. That does not mean they are actually responsible, although you should keep the possibility of neglect or abuse in mind, and your role is not that of an investigator. Further inquiry is the responsibility of the law enforcement official. Some EMS systems arrange for home visits after a child death so that EMS providers and family members may come to some sort of closure. You need special training for such visits as these. A child's death can be difficult for health care providers. Take time before going back on the job. Talk with other EMS colleagues. Be alert for signs of post-traumatic stress in yourself and others, such as nightmares, restlessness, difficulty sleeping, lack of appetite, and a constant need for food. You should consider the need for professional help if these signs occur. In summary, children are not only smaller adults and more vulnerable, they are also anatomically, physiologically, and psychologically different from adults in some important ways. Infancy is the first year of life. The toddler is from age 1 to 3, preschool 3 to 6, school age 6 to 12, and adolescence are 12 to 18. The general rules for dealing with pediatric patients of all ages include appearing confident, being calm, remaining honest, keeping parents or caregivers together with the pediatric patient as much as possible. The growing bodies of the pediatric patient create some special considerations. The tongue is larger relative to other structures, so it poses a higher risk of airway obstruction in an adult. Than in an adult, sorry. An infant breathes faster than an older child. Breathing requires the use of chest muscles in the diaphragm. The airway in a child has smaller diameter than the airway in an adult and is therefore more easily obstructed. A rapid heartbeat and blood vessel constriction helps pediatric patients compensate for decreased perfusion. A child's internal organs are not as insulated by fat and may be injured more severely, and children have less circulating blood. Therefore, although children exhibit the signs of shock more slowly, they go into shock more quickly with less blood loss. A child's bones are more flexible and bend more with injury, and the ends of the long bones where growth occurs are weaker and may be injured more easily. Because a young child might not be able to speak, your assessment of his or her condition must be based in large part on what you can see or hear yourself. Families may be helpful in providing vital information about an accident or illness. Use the pediatric assessment triangle to obtain a general impression of the infant or child. You will need to carry special sizes of airway equipment for pediatric patients and use a pediatric resuscitation tape to determine the approximately sized equipment. The three keys to successful use of the BVM are have the appropriate equipment in the right size, maintain a good face mask seal, and ventilate at the appropriate rate and volume. Signs of shock in children are tachycardia, poor capillary refill, and mental status changes. You must be very alert for these signs in pediatric patients because they can decompensate quickly. Febrile seizures may be a sign of more serious problems such as meningitis. The most common cause of dehydration in children is vomiting and diarrhea. Life-threatening diarrhea can develop in an infant in hours. Fear is a common reason why parents or caregivers call 911. Fever, I'm sorry, is a common reason. Body temperatures of 100.4 or higher are considered to be abnormal. Remember, trauma is the number one killer of children in the United States. A victim of SIDS will be pale or blue, not breathing, and unresponsive. He or she may show signs of post-mortem changes, including rigor mortis and dependent lividity. If so, call medical control to report the situation. Carefully inspect the environment where a SIDS victim was found, looking for signs of illness, abusive family interactions, and objects in the child's crib. You should provide support for the family in whatever way you can, but do not make judgmental statements. Any death of a child is stressful for family members and for health care providers. In dealing with the family, acknowledge their feelings, keep any instructions short and simple, use the child's name, and maintain eye contact. Be prepared to respond to philosophical as well as medical questions, in most cases, by indicating concern and understanding. Do not be specific about the cause of death. Be alert for signs of post-traumatic stress in yourself and others after dealing with the death of a child. It can help to talk about the event and your feelings with EMS colleagues. I do want to apologize to all of you. I know I've been off with the PowerPoints just a little bit, but all of the information is contained both in the PowerPoints and in the, in the audio. So if you have questions, please bring them to class with your instructor. And I also apologize for the length of this video, but the pediatrics chapter is unusually long. Thank you.